I'm, I'm sorry. For this one video, I can't even remotely be objective. In 1994, my family purchased a Sega Mega Drive and with it a copy of Sonic 3. I had played video games before this, I had visited friends and I gloried in prior games consoles. Plenty of familiarity with Sonic the Hedgehog because I had seen his games both on the Sega Master System and the Sega Genesis. I was completely unaware of the conversation that my parents were having at the time. They had registered my interest in a video games console for some time and considered carefully the pros and cons of purchasing one. What they did not like were the pictures they saw of people punching, kicking and shooting each other. This kind of cheap promotion of easy violence was something that they were not particularly keen on and throughout my early childhood, there was not a single game on my original Mega Drive collection that featured a protagonist armed with a rifle or a knuckle duster. So no Streets of Rage. That was fine though, that was fine. My friend had a copy. And a few years later, I sank far too much money into the arcade machine that boasted a full playable version of Metal Slug in the holiday arcade rooms. Why Sonic the Hedgehog? Well, ignoring the fact that this was the United Kingdom, and in 1994, Sonic literally was the coolest character on the planet. Apparently, they had glanced at the difference between Sonic and Mario and concluded that this was better. I mean, Sonic featured a hedgehog who smashes evil machines and frees the caged animals inside. That is an awesome positive message about being kind to wildlife and promoting an environmentally friendly lifestyle. What was Mario, on the other hand, but a fat man who jumps and stamps down on people's heads? Not just boring, but an awful message to send to your child. And so Sonic 3 became my first video game. The first one that I owned myself. The first one that I put into my own, or technically the family's, video games console. And it was a delight. I remember the awe as I ran through Angel Island Zone, just marvelling at how lush and vibrant the forest looked. Just look at how green those trees are. The rocks are just vibrant against the background. Sonic has this brilliant half-tone shading effect to make him look almost three-dimensional. Angel Island Zone is a fantastic opening level, and it explains clearly how this game had a completely different mission statement to both Sonic 1 and Sonic 2. I passed over the evolution in game design in my Sonic 2 video to focus on the multiplayer innovation, but there was a clear design evolution as Sega moved from the first to the second game. They had perfected a game engine in the original Sonic the Hedgehog, but they treated the innovation as something to sprinkle liberally through the levels. So Spring Yard has lots of bouncy sections, Starlight, the roller coaster loops, Scrap Brain, the spinners that require you to roll into a ball to gain momentum. Only Green Hill Zone, the opening stage, was it's the only one that was fully designed to show off all elements of Sonic's movement throughout. That level was designed like a playground, so that you could show off mastery of movement and momentum at every opportunity. Marble Zone, the very original second act then, is a particular offender at restricting you into narrow corridors. It's not that Sonic doesn't work in a narrow corridor, but it is an old school game design, a hangover from previous platforming generations that Sonic team were keen to evolve out of. Sonic 2 transitions from this playground feel to an open roller coaster, where the player is encouraged to make use of the rolling loops and curving straight pathways every opportunity. The game is larger, but also faster, designed to reward memorization of optimal routes and split-second reflexes. Sonic Team had settled upon the idea of multiple pathways, usually a higher and a lower route, that interconnected regularly. Sonic 3 does things slightly different. The levels are more open than Sonic 1. They do have long speed sections following the Sonic 2 mold, but there is an increased emphasis on exploration and hidden secrets. Sonic 2 has plenty of these, but they are largely either well signposted or entirely optional. Sonic 3 made a point of hiding everything from shields, 
which now imbue special abilities that make them far more valuable than just simply protecting you for an extra hit, extra lives, and special stages to access the Chaos Emeralds. Sonic 2 had innovated by offering Supersonic, a Dragon Ball Z inspired super form that offered invulnerability from normal damage and increased speed, but at the cost of draining your ring supply. However, there, getting Supersonic was quite an arduous task for a new player to do, as the conditions for unlocking him early required expert play and forward planning. Sonic 3, however, did everything possible to encourage working towards this goal. It signposts the first few hidden special rings and scatters them liberally through the stages. You're not meant to just run through these stages, though you can, often. The designers want to offer you every opportunity to explore. They scatter the stages with gimmicks that will momentarily change up the way you play, or change the stage around you, making this the most immersive experience yet. It does this at the expense of raw speed, so I can see how gamers who had played through Sonic 1 and 2 first could be disappointed that this stepped back from that design philosophy of the original sequel. But for me, the increased variety of Sonic 3 never got intrusive to the gameplay. The moment when Robotnik sets fire to Angel Island Zone, transforming it from what was a lush island paradise to a barren wasteland. Then, when you run beneath his airship, narrowly avoiding an aerial bombardment before Robotnik himself flies past you in the forest to ambush you beneath the waterfall. Then, after besting him, when Knuckles collapses the stage beneath you to send you tumbling into the waterways below. Cue the next level. There is nothing complicated about these stage directions. It's not anywhere near as interactive as my child's brain perceived it to be, but it was both epic and unintrusive on the sheer joy of just playing through the levels. In any other Sonic game, I would be calling Hydro City the water level, but actually, in this game, the majority of the stages have at least some water in them. This is a brilliant move from Sonic Team's part, as Labyrinth and, to a lesser extent, Aquatic Ruin are tarnished by the negative reactions of players dreading what the water will do to their movement abilities. Going underwater is a traumatic thing for a hedgehog that cannot swim. It's not just the threat of drowning and that terrible, ominous music, but the reduced capability of the player to get out of it. However, the water sections in Sonic 3 are largely shorter and their danger is ameliorated by the water shields that provide infinite air and a useful bounce attack. Hydro City has the most water, but it is also a more open level than Angel Island. It offers some fantastic sections that really encourage you to let loose the speed and zip across the surface of the water. Again, small cinematic flourishes, but incredible for my childlike eyes that marveled at everything that was happening on the stage. Then there was Marble Garden. Not as fun as the first two stages, but it has its moments. It's almost the inverse of Hydra City. It highlights exploration with short bursts of speed to move you from one arena to the next. Now Sonic 3 shines when it finds a balance and for many people, Marble Garden is the most clearest unbalanced stage there is, largely due to how obtrusive its spinning top gimmick can become and the enemies that you must defeat in order to open doors to proceed to the next area. The boss is a truly innovative one though, with Sonic taking to the air, carried by Tails to chase down his adversary. It takes a bit of patience to figure out the mechanics of flight, but it really is an improvement over the static sky chase zone from the previous game that was brilliant in the instant but tediously long on repetition. Tails Return also brings the capability for multiplayer gaming, both collaboratively in the main adventure or in a two-player Grand Prix mode. In the main game, Tails has now been buffed so that he can fly on demand, giving player two increased agency and capability of movement. Now the second player is not just following Sonic, but they can momentarily take the lead and carry their companion up to reach hidden items. The Grand Prix mode also gives a tantalising hint about how the new character, Knuckles, would look as a playable character. Sonic, Tails and Knuckles could be selected to play through some small, looping new stages that were specifically designed to cope with the restrictions of split-screen multiplayer. These have 
bespoke graphics that, whilst primitive compared to the main game, were brilliant to look at. Meanwhile, after the aerial battle, Tails lands Sonic in a new, strange area, full of vibrant colours and flashing lights. The zone finds that elusive balance that separates Hydra City and Marble Garden. It is blisteringly fast for the majority of its runtime, but with plenty of hidden secrets and looping pathways. The gimmicks are largely unintrusive, with a short underwater sequence where Knuckles floods the stage, points where you need to dodge spinning barrels, or sparks of electricity that fly when enemies zet from one location to another. I was content that this was shaping up to be the best video game ever, when suddenly, jarringly, Sonic 3 comes to a halt. It stops moving because there is a moment where the understanding of one of the poorly explained gimmicks suddenly becomes mandatory to allow progression. I had played through this level several times looking for an alternative pathway, but it appeared there wasn't one. And a year later, I even went out and bought a magazine that boasted level maps of all the Sonic games, and I studied it to prove to myself that there wasn't an alternative route. No, no, no matter what choices you make early on in the stage, you are directed through these one-way tunnels, past the door that closes behind you, and then simply just trapped inside a room with a single bouncing barrel. Now these these bouncing barrels they'd been seen in the stage before. They were there were several barrels, some that did not move, some that moved along a fixed path, and some barrels that bounced when you landed on them. It was a brilliant bit of physics that I had absorbed into my routine and largely treated as something to be avoided. Their behaviour was unpredictable and therefore best left alone. But this room, with this one barrel, was impossible. I, I, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out what to do. Not for the life of me, work out what, what were the game designers expecting of me. I jumped on the barrel. I jumped off the barrel. I timed my jumps. I found I could get incredible air. And I started looking for hidden passageways in the ceiling or the walls above me. I perceived a path below, but no matter how much momentum I pushed into the game, it would not, it could not let me through. Even in two player mode, with Tails alongside you, with the two players jumping in tandem, using their combined momentum to push the barrel up and down, this feat was just impossible. Defeated, I took Sonic 3 out of my Mega Drive and I began to play through Sonic 2. I completed it. And after that, I played through Sonic 1 and completed that. They were good games. They're great games even. But they weren't the same. Why couldn't Tails fly? Where was Knuckles? Why was there no save function? Why did I have to restart from the first level every time? Eventually, a gaming magazine landed in the newsagents that boasted cheats and I marvelled at the fact the games had a level select feature. This was common back in the day, before the internet was in every household. For gaming magazines and periodicals, your main source of news, reviews and secrets was magazines. I'd learnt the level select code for Sonic 1 at school. That one was easy to memorise. Up, down, left, right, A on the title screen. But Sonic 2 and 3? were more complex. In Sonic 3 you have to press up, up, down, down, up, 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 up on the title screen, all after Sonic appears but before he starts wagging his finger. Desperate to return to my favourite game, I got my cartridge out of its box and I put it back in the Mega Drive where it belonged. These were a lot of buttons to press in an incredibly short period of time, but the Mega Drive has a very handy reset button that you can hammer on each failure. And so I tried again and again, hammering away until the buttons worked again and again and again. Each failure after each failure I got closer and eventually I managed it. And I discovered a wealth of stages. Some of them were real and some of them weren't on the level select screen. And after Carnival Night Zone, the next one was Ice Cap. And I was amazed to see Sonic on an ice board skating downhill. How cool was that? How cinematic? How unfair was it that I'd been robbed of this? 
Then there was Launch Base Zone, which leads on to the climactic final battle with Eggman on the Death Egg as his satellite launches. I had played Sonic 1 and 2 now, I was versed in the Hedgehog's lore. I'd seen how Sonic 2 led into Sonic 3, and I knew what the Death Egg meant, how dangerous it was. But that final confrontation against the big arm boss was terrifying. I'd done it. I'd completed the game, finally. Ex except I hadn't. There was a portion, a decent length according to the level map I'd obtained, of Carnival Night Zone that I'd never played through. Then the sequel, Sonic and Knuckles came out and I was able to play through a whole new set of zones that followed on from these. Better still, with Knuckles as a playable character in the original game, it becomes possible to skip this dreaded room and finally complete the zone. In 1995, I finally completed a full playthrough of Sonic 3 zones and then the complete Sonic 3 and Knuckles playthrough. I did it with Knuckles the Echidna not Sonic or Tails, but the accomplishment was real. In 1996, whilst other console manufacturers were diving headlong towards polygonal graphics, Sega released Sonic 3D that took an isometric approach to the topic. I adored it, but my school friends had moved on. My friend threw out his Mega Drive and he bought a Sony PlayStation. In 1998, whilst playing at his house, he showed me a gaming magazine he'd kept thinking of me that had pictures of the upcoming new game for the Sega Dreamcast. These first few screenshots of Sonic Adventure were truly something special, and compared to what was available on the PlayStation at the time, amazing. But I'd stopped buying video games. I hadn't bought a new one since Sonic 3D in all probability, so there was no way I was going to get my hands on a Dreamcast anytime soon. I had learned about a missing Sonic game, however, for the Sega CD, which had also apparently been ported to the PC. My family had bought a PC, and I had immediately made a use of it to devour innovative titles like Command & Conquer Red Alert, Tomb Raider 2, and Speedboat Racing. These were the games that I treasured through these years, although I did keep the Mega Drive plugged into the TV. It was always comforting to get back to the classics, to go back to my childhood. My dad hunted high and low for the Windows copy of Sonic CD, but eventually, admitting defeat, I decided that I'd like Rayman 2 for my birthday. That was a great choice. But Sonic 3 had turned into a mark of shame. I'd played almost every element of it. I'd completed everything that could be completed, except for this one damned room. There was a bit of resentment. And then, one day, as the internet became more and more common, and I began to learn about the video game websites, I decided, on a whim, to search to see if they had the answer. My friends had failed me. Gaming magazines had failed me. I had no expectations of the internet. But, tentatively, I typed into the search engine the question, how do you get past the barrel in Sonic 3? I found an answer. And now, 20 years later, I cannot remember whether it was delight that I could finally complete my favourite game, or rage that the answer really was that simple. Because this was not something I had ever given up on. Year on year, I had gone back to this stage Hours had been spent trying to work out what I was meant to do. Perhaps you could get back through that door. No. Then perhaps it had to be a special timing in your jumps. This level had become an obsession. It had been a stumbling block that had reshaped my childhood. A defining moment of learning to cope with disappointment. The looping music, one of the oddest and most out there tracks in the whole Sonic franchise, had been burned into my very soul as something akin to the background track of this seventh circle of hell. For the love of God, just let me through. I can see where I'm going. Let me down there. And not once in the entire time had I thought for a moment that you were just meant to stand still and hold up and then down. Anyone out there who wants to learn to be a video game designer, who has ambitions for that career path, 
I implore you, play test your games. Get others to play test your games and beware of any moment, anywhere, where someone turns around and says, this mechanic is not explained very well. Take note of this one tiny insignificant flaw that turned what is otherwise possibly the best video game of all time into something that quite literally ruined my childhood.